This is The Widow Podcast and I am Karen Sutton, The Widow Coach. I'll be supporting you through the loss of your life partner so you can find a more positive way through your grief. I want to give you hope after loss and to know that when you are ready, you can create a meaningful life for yourself with the help of me, Karen Sutton and The Widow Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Widow Podcast. Today, I'm going to be having a really interesting conversation with the lovely Lindsay. Lindsay Wright is here to join us. Lindsay is a widow herself. Her husband, Stuart, died in January 2022. Lindsay is also a mum. Lindsay works in business. We say business. She runs her own business, um, Link Engagement. And this is, we'll talk about it more. It's really interesting. So essentially, Lindsay helps um, teams fix communication and collaboration problems so that they can work better and get better results and, and does this through understanding different personality types. And what Lindsay has noticed is that our different personality types affect so much in our lives and effectively and obviously probably this filters into our grieving patterns, styles, journeys in terms of how we show up, the choices that we make, how we perceive our grief and the choices that we make in it, our relationships with others, family, friends around us and how how we support ourselves, how we show up. And when I met Lindsay, I thought, do you, do you know what? This is fascinating. I've I've thought about this for a long time in terms of you know, I support a lot of widows um, in their grief and we have a lot of conversations and in my programs, there's so many different perspectives and outlooks and they're all valid. And I really notice how people have different personalities, people have different traits and characteristics and how these impact somebody's outlook and how they, I guess, navigate their path forward. So we're going to explore this, but I'm going to let let Lindsay get a word in and, and say hello and introduce herself and tell us a little bit about Stuart. So welcome, Lindsay. Thank you so much for being here and joining us. Oh, it's absolutely a pleasure, Karen. I mean, I have listened to your podcast for the last two and a half years and it is, uh, it's really helped me in some of my, my darkest days. A lot of what you say has really resonated. So it's it's super exciting that I'm a, it's a point in my journey where, where I can be on the other side of the podcast and, and be offering some support to, to other people who are in the same boat. Um, but it's also great to be able to, to chat this through with you. It is. Bless your heart. Thank you, darling. So tell us, tell us a little bit about Stuart. So uh, Stuart and I uh, met online. Um, so I had sort of a big corporate career, hadn't really met the right person, and I delved into the, the funny world of online dating. And um, Stuart and I met, ironically, because I'd had enough of the people who were on online dating, and I'd gone in to close all my accounts down. And I went into the, the website, and there was this amazing message from Stuart, very personal, very, just very lovely. And and we had a date, rest, rest was history. And um, so we were a little bit older when we met. So we met and sort of bought a house together and, and got married relatively quickly um, in 2011. Um, and then we had a honeymoon baby. Lily came along nine months and a week after we got married. We were very efficient. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and it, it was lovely. Um, Stuart was um, a couple of years younger than me. Um, but, we, you know, he was he worked in IT project management. And in fact, when he passed away, he was working for the NHS test and trace system, looking at how they could take what they created for COVID and apply it to other um, illnesses, uh, whether they could have that same sort of contact tracing system and apply it across other other illnesses. It was really interesting, the work that that he was doing. Um, and he loved Manchester United. That was his big passion. Manchester United, Ardbeg whiskey and curry. 
I think were his his three big passions outside of um, outside of me and Lily. Um, we live near Windsor, um, so southeast. I'm from Yorkshire originally, um, but Stuart has always lived um, sort of in this in this area. And and yeah, we we just had a very nice, normal, everyday sort of life. Um, 2021, um, Christmas 2021, um, Stuart contracted COVID. Um, we we both avoided it, um, and we you know isolated, followed all the rules. I'd homeschooled, all of those things, um, and Stuart contracted COVID probably about two weeks before Christmas, and he was really poorly with it. And then Lily got it. So they both, so for the first few days, Stuart was locked in a room upstairs and I was sort of delivering plates of food and we were staying away. And then Lily contracted it and it was like, well, game over, game over. There's no way I'm not being with my child. So, you know, we'll just suck it up. I never got it, um, but Stuart and Lily were both incredibly poorly, really, really poorly. Um, and Stuart lost his taste and smell and, you know, really hit him very, very hard. He then started to come out of it as we got to Christmas. We were hosting Christmas. Stuart used to always cook Christmas dinner. And I vividly remember Christmas Day, him saying, well, this is great. He said, but I can't taste it and I can't, <laughs> can't smell it. And I'm like, well, I can tell you it's gorgeous, but... But he so he got through the he was testing negative by then. But but he still had a lot of, you know, the symptoms were hanging on as they as they were doing. I think it was the was it the Om, Omicron variant. Anyway, it was whatever variant it was then. And so he'd um, he'd been, you know, quite poorly and then then started to pick up and between Christmas and New Year. Obviously, we were off on hol uh, you know Christmas holidays and Lily had got better and, and that was all fine. And. Uh, and then fast forward to 2nd of January, it was a Sunday, so the weekend before we were going back to school and work, I'd arranged to go out and meet my best friend with her two children. We're going to go to a National Trust place and do the Christmas lights as a last treat with all the children. And um, we'd ironically had the house valued that morning because we were debating moving. So we'd had people around at the house and then we'd have lunch together. And I was uh, I was putting my shoes on to leave with Lily and Stuart just stood and said, oh, I've got a really funny pain. He was in the kitchen, was, a really funny pain. And I said, oh, have you got a bit of indigestion? Do you eat a bit too fast? He said, no, I don't, don't know. And the last words he he consciously said to me was, I wonder if this is what a heart attack feels like. And then, and, and Lily and I were in the kitchen and he suddenly got this shooting pain sort of in his chest that went right up into his jaw, into his face. And he just, I mean, they talk about people going gray and unless you've seen it, you don't know what that means, but it, it was awful. And he literally went gray. And he was quite a big guy, was Stuart. Um, and, uh, and so I'm like, right, I'm, I'm phoning, I'm phoning the ambulance. So I, I phoned the ambulance Stuart was able to have a very brief conversation, but then suddenly went clammy and he had this pain. It was clear to me he was having a, a heart attack, um, but I'm not a medic. I didn't know. Ambulance were here in three minutes, three and a half minutes. They came immediately. I ran outside to open the gate to say, yes, it's us. We're here. Lily's screaming. She was nine at the time. She's crying. I don't really know what's going on. Stuart had then gone to the loo and he came back from the loo and as the ambulance crew ran into the house he collapsed so there were three of them and me and we caught him and and laid him on the ground and they said yes he's he's having a he's having a heart attack and then he he didn't speak again essentially he was conscious and he was breathing but only, only just and he was very poorly very 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 quickly and they did all the tests and the ECG and they said, oh, we've just got to get into hospital. So um, they said to me, he he didn't need a defibrillator because his heart was still beating. So they were planning on taking him to the cardiac unit to get a stent put in and all sorts of things. So they took him out of the house. And, and at that time, it was COVID time, so I couldn't go with him. They wouldn't let me get in the ambulance with him. And of course I had Lily. And so they're like, no, you stay here at the house don't phone us, we'll phone you, give us your number. 
and they'd sent me around the house I think to make me feel useful packing a bag for him so I'd packed him a rucksack and off that went and the ambulance crew had spoken to Lily and said you know daddy's really poorly but we're going to take him to the hospital and look after him so they then went and in between while I phoned my friend said we're not coming she said we're on our way and and then I was sort of sat with medical paraphernalia all over the the kitchen floor and I'm just like what the heck has just happened but do you know what Karen at, and and this feels silly now saying it at no point at no point did I not think he would come home I thought we'd have to change our lifestyle I thought he'd get a bit of a telling off I thought we'd have to you know perhaps he'd have to have an operation and, and we'd have to get him out walking a bit more but I never thought he wouldn't come home at, at all. It just wasn't on my radar. I then phoned his mum. He was just about to turn 80. So I phoned his mum and I phoned my mum. And then the hospital phoned me and said, we are actively resuscitating your husband. What? I don't know. No, no, no. He was combative, but he was breathing like 10 minutes ago. I don't understand. And um, and they said, well, we're actively resuscitating. You need to get here and you need to get here fast and you need to prepare yourself for the worst. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you probably shouldn't drive. And I'm like, what? what? I don't really know what to do. And and I was completely shell shocked by this point. I was and, and I was shaking and I was on my own. I was like, I just don't know what to do. And they said, well, we're going to send the police for you. I didn't even know the police did this. They said, we're going to send the police for you. I'm like, okay, we've got we've got a, a cop car coming to pick you up, to bring you to the hospital, gather your things. Um, I'm like, okay. And then what happened was, in very quick succession, my best friend walked through the door with her children and the police arrived. My best friend pushed me out the door with the police and said, we'll stay with Lily. So... So I then got in this cop car, police car, blues and twos, never had that before. If it wasn't for this reason, I might have been quite excited, sirens and lights, but, you know, and they just sort of kept me talking, got to the hospital, and they rushed me through this side entrance, told them at the, in A&E who I was. I got ushered into this side room, this waiting room, and... And I, and I can remember this so clear, so clearly. It's funny how what you can remember. Yeah. But um, this doctor walked in with three nurses and there was like a, a two seater sofa and a couple of chairs. And the nurses came in and they moved them all into this semicircle. They just moved all the chairs into this circle and they sort of sat me down. The nurses sat either side of me and held my hand. And I was just like, oh, no. Oh, no. You know how you just know? You, you just. Yeah. You just know they're going to say something you don't want to hear. And and it was this sort of very surreal moment. He was a lovely doctor, but he came in, he sort of leant forward and he just said, I'm so sorry. We we tried to resuscitate him for an hour and we couldn't get his heart back. And that whole thing from him saying, I've got a pain to that moment was 90 minutes. Less than a film less than a football match 90 minutes and in 90 minutes my whole world shattered and I was just no no I just no you that can't be true don't believe you that's no not true not true and yeah it was and what I and we had to go through an inquest and various things but what I learned at the inquest was although his heart was still beating when he left the house as soon as he got into the ambulance outside the house his heart stopped and so then they were resuscitating him in the ambulance all the way to the hospital and and at the hospital. And it, it was too much. They couldn't get him back. And we don't know what happened. All I know is that it was a blood clot. It was caused by a blood, blood clot that he wouldn't have known he had. So the doctor said he's not being a typical bloke. He's not ignored something. It, it just happened. could have happened to a marathon runner. It's just a, a, a blood clot. We don't know why he had a blood clot, but everybody's best guess is that it was COVID. Because there is a body of research now that says there is a heightened risk of blood clots in middle-aged men post-COVID. So although he didn't die of COVID, and it doesn't say that on his certificate, 
he was a COVID statistic because he died within four weeks of a positive COVID test. And, um, and they think it was, it was the after effects of COVID that caused the blood clot. And, and that was it. Yeah. It's like you say, isn't it? It's just how quickly your world can, <sighs> can change. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's a moment and you know to your point you know with Stuart stood in the house sort of saying all oh, this I've got I've got a really funny pain and yeah. you know not feeling great um you never you, you you know it's never kind of on your mind thinking oh god I mean I mean it is for me now whenever somebody says oh I feel a bit funny or something I immediately yeah. jump to to that of course but yeah. before um you don't you really don't and Oh my God. It's, it's just trying to understand that. Mm. It, it, I mean, it's just, it's too much, isn't it? it for, it's for so our hard. And I, and I remember coming home thinking he was here for lunch and he's not here for tea. I remember looking, we had a, like a menu planner on the fridge and he would fill it in every week. We'd talk about what we we're going to eat and he'd fill it in and there was his writing and we were going to have prawn stir fry and rice for dinner. And and I never had prawn stir fry rice. In fact, I'm not sure I ate for a few days. But mm. and I was like, how 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 is he not here for his prawn stir fry? I, it was like I, I just I couldn't comprehend. And then of course you come back and there's cars still on the street, people still walking their dogs, people watching TV in the street. And I'm like, how can you be doing that? My world has just stopped. H how was yours not? you know um that is the most surreal thing isn't it i remember um the day after simon dies driving through town because we had to go and do something i can't remember what it was now i was with my dad driving through town and people just walking around having a chat laughing drinking a yeah. coffee and you, and you it, it, it's so surreal isn't it because you think mm. how is the world still turning this yeah. this huge tragedy my person has just died and you're all carrying on like nothing has happened. Yeah. It's, it, it, it feels so wrong, so wrong. And, and you do feel like you've been thrown into an alien world, don't you? That you just kind of go, I, I, I don't, how is this? I don't, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You feel like you're swimming through treacle. Mm. You just, you know, and you're not even moving forward at that point. You, you're literally just trying to stay afloat. I remember that. Because my so I came home and then I had to tell Lily. So I came home from the hospital because my my so my mum in law had arrived at the house. My my best friend had brought her to the hospital. I then had to tell my mum in law at the hospital, and and then we went to see Stuart. And then we came home, and I remember being in the car coming home, thinking, I have to tell my daughter. I have to tell Lily, who was nine, and. And the really sad thing was when she was seven, so two years before, we'd lost my dad to cancer. It was a really short battle with cancer. And I felt, and I that hit me really hard. And I felt because my dad was my other person. He was he was my rock, was my dad. I was a real daddy's girl. And Lily didn't have another grandpa because Stuart's dad had died when she was a baby. So my dad was really important to Lily. So we were just starting to come through that. And Stuart had been my rock when my dad died and so suddenly we would both lost our two big male role models and she'd lost both before she hit double figures mm. and I was like how I can't I, how do I how do I break this news but of course then what happens and and you'll have gone through this yourself because you have girls is actually you then become a mum and and sort of your feelings then don't well they do matter but they don't matter as much you're you're much more concerned about I found myself I was I was looking after my daughter and my mum-in-law both of whom were in absolute crisis and I was like well I just just gotta get on with it haven't I I'll just yeah I remember the day after he died I had his sister and his mum in the house and like three million people and I'm standing there making chicken sandwiches for everyone I'm like what's this what's this all about you know but it's you know mad. you just it is yeah. mad when I look back but you just do it don't you you, just... you do and and how you think you're going to be in those situations is often nothing like how you actually are it, it, it's very different in real life so thinking about then your role your job um yeah. your, your chosen career and 
you know, obviously being very aware of people's different personality types and how this can impact sort of working relationships and conflicts and how you bring that together. When did you start to notice, I suppose, you, you, I guess your personality type? Because you you must know you quite well working in, in, in this area and, and, and have a very sort of clear understanding of, of how you respond in certain situations and, and your your outlook, your perspective. Was it something immediate that you put together in terms of relating it to your grief? Or was it something that as time passed you, you, and you started, I guess, maybe connecting with other widows, understanding more about grief, that you then started to connect the dots and think, God, actually, the, the, these two are, are quite closely connected. Yeah, really interesting question. So um, you're right. I've always known who I am. But what was really interesting, so it didn't come immediately, because at first, like everyone else, I was just in sort of a holy moly what has just happened to me mm. um and I I just did what I I just did what I needed to do I did what I needed to do to cope I did what I needed to do from a, a sad min perspective I did what I needed to do for Lily I just did my stuff and it was only then you know a few sort of weeks down the line when I sort of connected in your group and I came across other widow groups and I met other widows and I started to, because at that moment I was just in my own world. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't really aware of how anyone else was dealing with things. Although I, I was much more conscious of my mum, who obviously had been widowed. But my mum was widowed in her seventies when they'd been together fifty years. Quite different from being widowed in your forties. So Stuart was forty-six when he died. So being widowed in your forties with with a nine-year-old child. Um, so so I was quite early on comparing my grief journey to my mum's. Um, but I think it was a little bit further down the line. So at the time when Stuart died, I wasn't in my business. My business existed, but because of COVID, I parked it. My background is actually corporate communications. So I've got a 20 year career in, in corporate comms and crisis management. Um, the, the psychometric world or the team world has come to me later because of a, a slight job change I had in my last role. And so I'd put that on hold. Um, but it over a period of time, and I'd taken another role, over a period of time, it start as I'd started to, what's the word, wake up? I'd started to just come through the fog. The fog had started to lift a bit. And I was starting to think, actually, you know, one of the biggest things I challenges I found was that sense of identity. Who am mm. I now? And this is where it really started to come to life for me. It was, I knew who I was when I was with Stuart. I was happy with that version of me. I knew who I was before I met Stuart. But now I'm, neither, I'm a bit of both of those, but I'm actually somebody different. And over a period of time, I started to see little shoots of the old me coming back. And I was like, well, I quite, quite like this me, but I'm still not sure who I am. And then I started to step back a bit and look and look at how I dealt with those early days of grief and where I say to you I was just in in my zone doing my stuff I became very aware that other widows don't always do that other people don't do their stuff they because it's so heavy for them they struggle to get out of bed in the morning and they you know just having a shower is is a massive achievement and I and I realized that I was different to that. And there's no right or wrong. Everybody has their own journey and everybody deals with it differently. But I started to realize then that who I am and, and my, my style and my approach had absolutely come to the fore during essentially my, my biggest crisis. Um, and, but what was interesting for me was I learned something really, really important about myself. So typically and classically, I am rubbish with detail. I am utterly rubbish. Don't give me an Excel spreadsheet. You know, I like I like telling stories. I'm extroverted. I like being with people. I don't want to lock myself away. So for me, my coping mechanism when and even now when I'm in the depths of grief, I want to pick up the phone to a friend. 
I just want to talk to somebody. Whereas other people don't want to talk to people. They want to withdraw. They want to meditate. They want to go for a walk. They want to be on their own. I get my energy from being around the right people. But I also don't deal well with details. So sadmin was a nightmare for me because it is it's emotional, it's painful, you're dealing with incompetent organizations in a lot of cases. I mean, I've lost count of the number of times I suggested we we hire a medium because they wanted to speak to the account holder. I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't know how many times I have to tell you, he's really not interested in his credit card. He really doesn't care anymore, you know. How do I know the solar panels are yours? They're attached to my roof. I mean, you know, what more do you? Anyway, we've all, got, we've all gone through that. But what I realized about myself was when I was in that real, I don't know how to put a foot forward. My world has imploded. I do not know what comes next. Actually, where I went to was detail. I wrote lists, lists and lists and lists. And and I just wrote everything down. And then I just used to tick something off a list. And, and if I only tick one thing, I, I felt better. Now, I don't live by lists. I, I, I wing it in my life. It's, it's bad. It's not a great thing always. I have some lists in work. I have lists at home. No, I just go with the flow, see how I feel. You know, I have a calendar and that's about as far as I go. But, but when I was in this place, I absolutely went to a place of detail. Now, one of the tools I use is a psychometric tool and my natural tendency is the polar opposite to detail so that's my lowest set of traits doesn't mean I can't access them but I I don't naturally go to that place but I learned that that was what I needed and so that awareness for me of actually something that I'm not naturally strong in became a real rock for me was really really interesting and not what I would have expected but also that sense of I know I need people. So I work for myself and I I live in my little office. I started to feel like my home was a prison because Stuart wasn't here. Lily was at school. I was in the house all day because I was working. Then I was in the house in the evening with Lily because, of course, when Stuart passed away, Stuart died, so did my social life because that's Mm. what happens. And suddenly I was like, I can't. can't." and actually going out for a walk on my own wasn't the answer for me. I, I needed that human interaction. And again, so I then started to, to reach out to people and I had to, I had to be quite brave to say, actually, I, I, I need a friend. Can you come for a walk? Will you, ha- will you come and have a coffee? But that awareness of actually this is what I need meant that I forced myself to ask for that help. And it was very forthcoming and therefore it massively helped my my grief and it helped me move through my journey. And I'm now nearly two and a half years in and I carry it much lighter now than I did a year ago. And of course, I I still get sad. I still have have awful days. I, I remember think about Stuart all the time, but day to day. Lily and I are in a better, stronger place. And she's very like me, so she needs friends as well. And so, you know, we both follow the same sort of pattern. But having spoken to other widows and seen things on, you know, different widow groups and, and like, you know, the Widow and Rising group, and, and I read some of the posts about how people are dealing with it, and there is no right or wrong, but I can I can see how... Other people perhaps are more introverted and and get their strength from themselves, from being in their own world, and and they want to just be in their own world, um, and that's and that's great. But there is something for me about what else do you have in your toolkit that might feel a little bit uncomfortable, but actually, what what else do you have that you could lean on or lean into? to to help you move forward in this journey because the truth is our people that we've lost don't want us to sit here and not have a life that's not what they want for us and I'm I'm really clear on that I know that the one thing I can do for Stuart now is to raise Lily 
to be a confident, smart, clever, feisty young lady who does great things in the world, but to give her experiences and, and show her the world and introduce her to things and, and be that role model to say, no, there is, there is there is a new book or a new jigsaw puzzle of our life in the future. Um, but it's my it's my self-awareness of, of me and recognising what, what I need and what doesn't serve me that has got me there. That's so interesting, isn't it? And, and I think you're very similar to me in, in that way because I'm, I'm very, very driven by living out a life for myself and the girls that, that Simon would kind of go, well done. Did you know? Like, don't, don't be defeated by this. Don't be taken down by it. Yes, it's going to be hard. You're going to be sad. But but find an inner determination to live again. And, and that drove me massively. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of widows and some people just don't feel that way because they, they, they can't see it in that way. Some people do see it in that way, but then don't know how to put that, that thought into practice. Yeah. And I think this is what I sometimes find really interesting that it, it it seems to me that some people are more equipped or, or more adept at kind of finding that, that inner drive, that resilience, that determination, that mindset and allowing it to form the choices and decisions that they make and when the the feelings of I can't do this it's because they still come don't they you know you still have those feelings of god you, you know this is actually too hard maybe I can't do it maybe I'm I'm deluded in some way um time, yeah. yeah absolutely um but but you still kind of go I'm not bloody giving up did you do you know I'm absolutely determined yeah. and I'm I'm gonna keep going whereas others will get more held in that space and again, exactly to your point there's no right or wrong there's no criticism or judgment this is merely observations that I'm really intrigued about that you know some people they do they get held in that place of discomfort where they go I'm never going to be happy again I I like the fact that I'm drawn to you, Karen, for, for, for what you've achieved and what you've done and the message you, you put out there into the world to, to offer us hope and a, a belief that life can be good again after loss. It's different, but it, it can still be good. Okay. Um, but there's something in me that just holds me here. And, and how, mm. what is that about? Do, do you know, it's, I've, and I know it's, it's so many factors, isn't it, Lindsay? It's, it doesn't just come down to, to personality, but you, you're right. You, you know, our, our person would 100% want all of us to go on and live. They, 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 you know, you wouldn't ask anyone that has died, do you want your person to be miserable for the rest of their lives because they miss you so much? No. <laughs> um, yet, that is some people's reality. That's not enough for them. I, I don't know. What, what's in that? Yeah, it, it, it is really interesting. I, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is determination is an interesting word. So in my world of sort of the tools I use, one of the tools I use is a colour based tool. And I know I'm high red and high yellow. I think you are, too. And, and one of the key traits of somebody who's high red is determination. So determination and ambition and drive are not natural tendencies for everybody so some people like me and I suspect like you it is quite a natural tendency and if you look back over your life you'll see other parts of your life when it came into when it came into play it's just a natural trait for you so it's absolutely right that when you're in grief when you're in your worst crisis those natural traits come out to play because, because it is inherently within you. Somebody who is the opposite of that, who is, um, in my world, is, is high green, is somebody who's much more caring, nurturing, much calmer, reflective, sort of withdraws a little bit. So, so to be out there and be determined and say, I'm going to go and live life again, is so such an alien concept to them that they have to 
put more than one foot in front of the other. They have to take, they have to run a marathon to get there. And when you're in crisis, you retreat to your natural safe space. Now for us, our natural safe space might be determination. It's like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm sad, I'm grieving, I feel terrible, but I am going to put one foot in front of the other because that's what I know I have to do. That comes easier for us than it does for somebody else who has a very different, so somebody who's more introverted, they grieve and they they have strength in, in other ways. Um, whereas for us who are more extroverted, that sort of determination and ambition is is more a natural trait for us. And I think, I think that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is no, no one knows what happens inside a relationship. And we all hold all these feelings of guilt and trauma. And, you know, so for me, Stuart died incredibly quickly. You know, he was here and then 90 minutes later, he wasn't. That, that is one set of emotions. Other people have to care for and nurse their loved one for, for months and years, watching them go through the most awful of illnesses. That, that is exhausting. And, and there's a whole, they've grieved for them every day for a year in a way. And, and, you know, and so that brings with it a whole different set of emotions. So I think there's something about the grieving journey and, and what happened to your person and, and what that journey was you went on. Because I also firmly believe you have to be in the right place here in your head to be able to get to a stage where you can move forward, which is why any blog you read or your podcasts or anything you read where people say, when's the right time to take off my wedding rings? When's the right time to start dating again? When's the right time to, you know, clear out their wardrobe? There is no right time. There is no right time because it is completely different for everybody. And you just know when it's the right time for you, which is why this is so complex because there are so many elements and facets to it but I do still keep coming back to we all have inner strengths and some of them we recognize some of them we don't and we all have an, an inner strength in us it just depends how how confident we are in reaching down and lifting it out and saying okay okay yeah time's right now time's right so many good points in that and, and you're you're so right that there, there is there's so much complexity to grief isn't there in terms of yeah. of how our person died um you know whether that was by suicide whether that was a sudden loss uh, an accident a long-term illness I, I mean there's just there's so much in that to, to unpick as well our different personality types our different circumstances our support networks where we're living that children that, that you there's so many factors. Um, but what I find really interesting, I think, with the personality types, we, we have our our fundamental core traits and, and characteristics. Yeah. And is it possible to change your personality type? Can you go from green to red? Or do you are you always a certain type of, of, of personality, of, of character, but you can learn how to be in different ways but your default will always be that that core green or or red or yellow or whatever it is yeah so it's a, it's a great it's a great question fundamentally i think our i think our personality traits are are there and they evolve over time so i i do this with people in work so they're always looking at it from a, a work perspective but the truth here is we have all of these colors we have access to all of these traits the whole if you mapped every trait in the world on a wheel we can go to all of them we can use all of them we've got them all inside us but we have preferences so it's a bit like folding your arms if i said fold your arms you can do it then i say well fold them the other way and there's a bit of oh, I'm not quite sure and I've got to look and I don't really know what I'm doing. It feels really uncomfortable, but I can still do it. And that's exactly what this is like. So we have an inner set of preferences of how we like to show up. But it doesn't mean we can't use the other ones. It just takes a bit more energy and it takes more effort and we need to think about it. We might need to lie in a dark room after we've done it. We might need to have two glasses of gin and tonic or we might need different coping mechanisms. 
So there will be, for example, there will be some widows who will see your retreat, for example, and think that's brilliant because I get my energy from people in the same boat. I'm going to come on the retreat. Then they sign up immediately. There will be others who think, I think there's some benefit in that for me, but I'm really scared. I don't want to open up in front of a group of strangers. I feel really uncomfortable with people I don't know. I'm nervous about being away from home. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And parking the cost side of things, this is just that sort of instinctive. And then, and then they try and get over the fence and they keep trying and then they oh, I don't know. Because actually for them, the idea of putting themselves out there to people they don't know is a really frightening thing. Now, some of them will then do it, and that's a massive, a massive, big, big tick because they've challenged themselves and they've done something amazing and they've got something amazing out of it. Some people will be like, bring it on, I'm, I'm doing it. And so, you know, I, I think it doesn't mean for those people who are nervous about it, they can't do it. They absolutely can. It just takes something out of them to, mm. to do it and to get there. I mean, I think, you know, there are certain there are certain times in your life where where you would move and, and you would flex your your color traits. But but in my world, we talk about dialing up and, and dialing down. I, I don't think in even with grief, I don't think you would fundamentally suddenly become green if you were very high red. I think what you would see is somebody dialing up their green traits. So they're stepping more into those those traits because that's what they need at that time to get them through but they still have the other traits in them that they they refer back to as a as a preference but it is an interesting point because something i read about a lot is um family relationships in grief is is what happens to our friendship groups and our family groups and there's so much talk on on forums about in-laws and about family relationships and friends and people who step up and don't step up and and it's all about expectations as as I've heard you say many a time and I've experienced some of that myself as well but now when I step back and and look at it with friends in particular there's absolutely an element of they don't know what to say they don't know how to handle it it's too scary and actually for me I felt very much a there but for the grace of god oh my goodness that could have been me you know particularly with school parents it was a bit of oh my goodness that you know um and, and so people don't know what to say so they choose to say nothing but i think when it comes to people who are in your inner circle family and closer friends what i'm now starting to look back on is actually i was so entrenched in my grief I didn't acknowledge and recognize their grief and I didn't acknowledge and recognize that they were different to me, different personality type, grieving in a different way, going through something different. And so actually I had these high expectations of them, but they couldn't meet them because they were grieving in a different way and, and we, were, we were too far apart from each other and, and neither of us, and these are different relationships, we're in a place where we could come together and, and be that honest because we were so entrenched and so I think recognizing that grieving takes different forms in different people around you and much as we feel we are the only one that's grieving and our grief is worse than anyone else because it was our person actually for our children it was their parent for our in-laws it was their child they're still big grieving journeys to to go through um you know and i i whenever i look at my daughter i see my husband so i totally I totally recognize that for his family mm. seeing my daughter is really hard for them yeah. but i didn't see that at the time you can't you know, so, can you no and and so i think that's where it, it i think i don't think we change i think we just show up in a different way during during times of grief and, and and I think you're right as we work through our grief you know it, it's very raw at the beginning and when I say at the beginning you, you know the first sort of six 12 months I think mm. you're in shock and you, you know you don't understand a, a lot of, of what's going on around you you're you're just in this alien world where you don't know who you are 
and you don't understand what's happening to you, your capacity to care about anyone or anything else is so diminished. And um, you, you almost worry, don't you, that, God, am I, am I going to have any friends left at the end of this because I'm giving them nothing and I don't even care about their little insignificant problems, <laughs> problems to them. Um, yeah. But to me, I'm just thinking, I, I, don't, I don't care. Um, relationships become really fractured. And I, and I think... You know, it's so true that often what causes the conflict in grief between friends and, and family is the judgment of different grieving styles, because we all have our own way. We all have our own belief system, which we might not even be consciously aware of of in terms yeah, of what true. our belief system around grief is but it's there we've picked it up over the years from experiences from society from films from friends and family all that kind of stuff so we've we've got this unconscious bias going on haven't we in our heads about what grief is what it should look like and how how we should be showing up and we are living that out whether it works for us or not and it might not be it might be um and then when other people are doing it differently there's there's a a judgment and, and sometimes a, a criticism because you can't understand why somebody else is is showing up in a different way or dealing with it in a different way. But your capacity to have compassion for that, I think, is so little because you, you just you just haven't got it. You haven't got the 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 the, the headspace or the yeah. brain power to kind of sit down and, and look at something and go, Oh, okay. Well, that's all right. I'm doing it this way and they're doing it that way. And, and it, and it's all good. We'll kind of meet in the middle. There's too much emotion. And, you know, as we say, don't we, you know, when emotions are high, intellect is low and not able to think logically and, and rationally. And, and you're right. It, it, it's as, as we find some breathing space, I think in, in our journey, yeah. And we're starting to find our feet, not that it's OK or that everything's mm -hmm. fixed, that we can start to recognize, actually, this is the same person that we're grieving, but it's different relationships and people yeah. are grieving that differently. Mm -hmm. But being able to sit down and have those conversations mm -hmm. are tough, are, are really mm -hmm. tough. And, and that's yeah. where things mm -hmm. become really quite complicated and messy and and. Mm -hmm. Within laws, especially, you know, there's so much, there's so much trauma and there's so many breakdowns in, in those relationships with, with in-laws. It's extra layers to the grief and, and it's hard, but I think this does give us a level of understanding so that we maybe don't take it so personally. Mm. And, and I think, I think it, it certainly has given me some tools. I mean, there are some conversations that I know I need to have and I'm shying away from them they will come in time but I'm, I'm starting to process what those conversations perhaps need to be um but I think it I think it gives us a bit of a, a toolkit but I think to your point about being so entrenched in it and not having compassion I think I think we also and it's totally natural and there's no judgment we become selfish as well mm -hmm. because there's a little bit around I've got so little headspace that the little bit of headspace I have I want to spend it doing something that's going to make me feel better or with people who make me feel better or doing something that makes me feel better, whatever that, whatever that looks like. And so I know for myself that I am a member of a number of different groups and online, you know, Facebook groups, your community, different things. But I know that sometimes I can go in in the morning and my newsfeed is full of everybody telling me how awful their widowed life is. And whilst I have compassion for it, it doesn't serve me. So I so I can't engage with it much as there's plenty I could say and I might be able to make someone feel better. Actually, I know that it pulls me down. And so there are days when I can deal with it and, and I will go in and, and say things and join the community. There are other days when I actively distance from it because I know that it actually it doesn't doesn't help. I, I want to talk to people who are telling me about, you know, hope and and a future and that actually they're doing great things and and positive things are happening that's what i need because i want to feel more like that but we are all different but i know that so i can be quite selfish and say today i'm not going to engage with that maybe i will tomorrow but today i need i need to talk to people who are going to make me feel better 
and so I think I think there's something about saying it's okay to feel like that it's okay to be selfish because we have to do what we need to do to get us through our grief which is a a long game it's a long journey um and 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 for me you know I know I've got it written down I've got it in my head I know what my two or three things are my go-to things or my go-to people that I can do that are just going to lift me out of it and make me feel better and some of those are quite surprising things that Mm -hmm. you know four years ago when when Stuart was here wouldn't have been a go-to thing or a person but but it's it, it's that it's that shift Shifts. of going to somewhere perhaps not natural because that's what I need at the time. And and I think you're, you're right. I think you almost you almost become a bit selfish because it's it's survival. Do, do you know mm. we we have to um, we have to protect our our energy. And when I say selfish, I don't mean in in terms of intentionally hurting or yeah. causing upset to others, no. but just actually putting your own needs first we we very much live in a society where we're we're all people pleasers to a certain extent and we all show up in a way that we think we should be showing up that's expected of us in in some way or another but actually you know when we're going through something like this it it is it is really understanding that we have to care for ourselves in a much deeper intentional compassionate way than we ever have done before and that that is recognizing what you are willing to to take on to to tolerate to put your energy into and and if you haven't got capacity for something or someone it's okay to to pull back and I think this is this is what's interesting isn't it I think Lindsay it's the more awareness and the the more understanding we have about ourselves, the greater we are able to navigate life's tragedies and challenges and adversities, because we can very much look at others and think, well, well, they're doing it this way. They've done it that way. They keep saying this. I, I, I want to believe that, but I, I'm not. I'm not quite there. I don't, I don't know how to put that into to practice. It all seems very nice. Um, but actually, if we can just take a step back and think, right, well, what what traits and character, characteristics do I possess that I can use to my advantage? Because yeah. exactly, you, you know, that we talk about strengths and weaknesses a lot. And I, and I think there's a, a place for that. But actually, it's recognizing what traits and characteristics you have, mm-hmm. where they serve you, and perhaps yeah. where where they don't mm-hmm. so much. But recognizing that all of them will come into play somewhere in our lives. It's just depending on the the situation, the experience, mm-hmm. that the things we draw on will be different. But they they all support us. But like you say, you know, whether you're an introvert or, or an extrovert, just knowing what what serves you, what doesn't, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether you are maybe more resilient than than somebody else and, and it's like drawing on right how how do I develop that resilience and and understand myself better so that you can forge your own way because I think it's not fair is it to look at others and and compare in in any situation in life it's it, again doing something like this I think that depth of knowledge and understanding about yourself is empowering so so empowering and I think you you make a really interesting point there which is around it's a it's as important I think to recognize those natural traits we have which hold us back which actually don't serve us and that's not to say we say we're never going to go there because we're humans we're not robots we we are all going to have those things will surface at certain times but but there's something about recognizing when it surfaces and and therefore what that's telling you and and what that means for you and what do we need to do to counterbalance that so we can get back to a a more a more positive place where where those traits are less visible because it's also about understanding not only where do they hold us back and they stop us from actively moving forward but where do they have an impact there's that ripple effect on other people where does it then show up where you know, you start shouting at your children or you start, you know, not not answering the phone to your friends or you start, you know, whatever, whatever it is, however it shows up, it it will. 
Mm. But but actually, how do we how do we sit with it and how do we and some of those emotions we might just need to sit with. It's okay to sit and I mean I had mm. yes a couple of days ago on the radio I had the radio on in the background and one of the songs from Stuart's funeral played on the radio and it's not a song you hear very often and I don't I have it so low that I don't really hear the radio but I heard the song and it just completely stopped me in my tracks and it made me cry and I was like okay we're just gonna cry we're just gonna have 10 minutes take a deep breath have a cup of coffee and then I'll be okay again you know and and that's and that's okay because that happens these these things happen but but actually that moment could have completely wiped out my day I could have let it wipe out the rest of my day and say right that's it I need to go and lie on my bed and and cry and look through all photo albums it's not to say I don't enjoy doing that sometimes but I knew that that doing that wasn't going to serve me it wasn't going to help me what I actually needed to do was try and not think of it as Stuart's funeral song but think of it as I played it because it's one of his favorite songs so it, it's a song that he loved so just smile think and and then we move on but that's a very conscious choice and I think you have to be all of this is about being strong you have to you have to know the knowledge you have to have the self-awareness but then you have to make a very conscious decision this is how I'm going to work with that situation or that strength or that thing that's holding me back and I don't think you get there overnight I think that's something that yeah. evolves over oh. time I guess I'm I'm lucky because I've been doing this work for eight or nine years it comes quite naturally to me now um but not it won't for everybody but but I think if somebody was listening to this and says well wh- what do I do how do I make this work for me I would get a piece of paper And I would literally draw sort of a line down the middle and I would literally just brainstorm with yourself. What what do people say about me? What what would somebody else say if I say, give me 10 words to describe me? What would they what would they say? And what are the what are the real positives? And then do a little bit of self critique. What are what are those traits that actually are less helpful to me, but they're part of me? What are the things that actually might not want to admit or I know that I can get a bit you know overbearing or I can get a bit shouty or you know I withdraw or ask too many questions or you know whatever it is and and just look at that and then just look at the list and then start to think well which ones of these do I like which which ones give me joy and and those are the ones you you sort of focus on I love what what you said there about some of the qualities that don't serve you so well ask too many questions I'm always being <laughs> told off because I ask too many questions people will be telling me a story and go well, well what, what about this what that? I don't know Karen I didn't I didn't ask that I did question I'm, and um sometimes it serves me um asking too many I think in what I do um I'm very curious and I, and I love to ask questions other times when people are, are maybe just trying to, to chat to me and I'm interrogating them I have to be aware of that and just go listen just listen to what they can tell you and don't start with the interrogation you know people often say to me it's like the Spanish Inquisition sitting down having a conversation with you totally but I think there's a fundamental difference between curiosity and questioning so I think asking questions because you're curious and you've got an interest in in people is is a positive trait but but questioning sometimes if somebody asks too many questions it's a sign of insecurity it can be I, I don't I don't feel you you put you put me in a corner here I don't feel like I'm able to make this decision I I feel under the cosh I feel like you're putting me under pressure so in order to procrastinate and just push you away a bit I'm just going to ask a whole load more questions so that it then goes back onto your desk for you to do more work to give me a bit of breathing space so I think there's a I think mm. there's a difference between those two so curiosity I think is a strength Spanish Inquisition (laughs) it's such you know what I just love it I love learning I love learning and growing and excuse me understanding myself and the people Mm. around me because I think what because that strengthens relationships as well doesn't it when you understand who you are how you're showing up how you come across how others are, are maybe responding to you mm. and and how, the choices they're making in life, that 
they're mirrors, aren't they? They're, they're mirrors to a lot of yeah. what's going on underneath the surface. And, and actually, it then becomes really interesting. If you can take away that personal aspect of things happening to you or people treating you in a way because of you and who you are, r- rather than looking at it and, and thinking, what's happened to them? Why, why are they mm. showing up in that way? How are they feeling that's leading them to behave like that? to to make those choices because there's always something underneath it isn't there there's always Always. something underneath it there is and I I totally agree with you but I think we have to recognize that when you are in the depths of grief you don't have the capacity to ask those questions no I think that comes I think that comes over time and I've certainly seen that in me I think I can be I say nearly two and a half years now which and then this is the other interesting thing for a lot of a lot of widows who will be listening to this. They'll say, well, that's not very long. No, it's not. Arguably, some people are two and a half years in and, and, and aren't where I am. Other people get to where I am 12 months in. No, no right or wrong. It's just it's different. But it, but it, and it's not about two and a half years for me. I just feel like at my point in my journey with my world and my bias and my support network and what I've got going on in my world um I can now step back and and have those reflections yeah. but I couldn't have done it a year ago no no and, and for somebody else back. it might be five years yeah because it, it, a year ago it felt very much like why has this happened to me this isn't fair you know why you know and I couldn't think why are you showing up that way it was just why are you not doing what I'm expect of you why why are you not showing up in the way that I need you to yes I couldn't sit there and think well actually what's going on for you that means you're beha- whereas I I can do a bit more of that yeah now. you're so That's right not to say not to say I'm not still a little bit I expected more of you and you should have shown up better there's an element of that there always will be but but I can be a little bit more reflective um, yeah and that takes time and, and to, to be in a certain place in our grieving journey. So question for you, Lindsay, yeah. that I, I, I ponder and I would just love your, your view on before we wrap yeah. this up. Yeah. Do you think that some of us, because of our personality styles, are better equipped at dealing with grief, hence why some of us get to a place of peace in life? Um sooner than others might do you think that has a part to play in it so I'm going to put my neck on the line here that's, that's a, a really, I was hoping you would <laughs> yeah it's a really great question honestly yes I do I do think that I do think that um I think there are it, it's not linear though as we both know and we've talked about that you know there are so many other factors at, at play I can only look at my journey and my relationship and my person in the way that you can look at your relationship, your support network, your person. Everybody is different. And it's like they used to say in in COVID times, oh, we're all in the same boat. No, 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 no. We were in the same storm. Our boats were very, very, very different. Um, And it's the same in grief. You know, we if if we have lost our person, we are in the same storm of grief but our boats are incredibly different and they've got different things in them. The holes are different sizes, the waves crash at different times. And, you know, the the people we've got in the boat with us are are very, very different. But I do think, I do think there is something about fundamentally who we are as people and, and how we have become who we are as people and what's happened to us in our, in our lives that make us more equipped to deal with, something like this um I do think that's true you know Stuart was my polar opposite so he on on in my world he as I'm you know in the car park yellow he was in the car park blue so we were absolute polar opposites to each other he if roles had been reversed he would have dealt with this very very differently and he would be in a very different place to me he would have retreated and and hidden in his world and hidden away and you know, and that's no criticism of that, but he wouldn't be where I am. He wouldn't be running his own business. I'm, you know, he wouldn't be doing some of the things that, that I'm doing because he was a different yeah. personality type. 
to me. Um, and so I do, I do, I do think some of those, and actually it is some of those extroverted traits, it is some of that drive, that ambition, that determination. I think if you naturally have that, I think it puts you, it, it enables you to refocus yourself in a slightly different way and perhaps quicker. Yeah. But essentially, we can all learn how to do that and draw on those. I think, do you know what, Lindsay? I could sit here and chat to you for hours. <laughs> it's so interesting. I find just human behavior and and our personalities and, and how we all face our situation so differently mm -hmm. to your point it's not as simple as that because there's so much that impacts these situations we find ourselves in mm -hmm. our upbringing our peers our family our, our location our financial mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. all of it you know how our person died the related there's so much like that you can't just put it down to personality but you know the more and more I do this the more and more I learn about myself and others the more I see these different personalities coming into to play and and how that impacts our journey and and the choices that we make and, and our perspective on it all and it it's no right or wrong there's no criticism or judgment it it's it's an understanding isn't it and I think when we understand better we are able to support ourselves better and I think that has to be at the heart of it doesn't it yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, that that bit of self awareness around, and actually a bit of honesty, a bit of yes. self reflection and honesty with mm. ourselves. And I I've had to do a bit of that where I recognised that in those early months, and everyone would excuse everybody's behaviour in those early months when you don't know what's happened to you. But you know, there was some stuff I did that I'm not proud of, or some things I said that I'm not proud of. Um, but I I recognise that and and you know there's no excuse but arguably there is um, you know um, and, and there's that element isn't there of you know unless you've walked a mile in my shoes don't don't tell me you know how I feel because your goldfish died you know yeah. it, it just doesn't doesn't wash um, but actually just that that self reflection around there are times when I know. I'm not proud of myself. So actually, that's all right. We can forgive ourselves for that. But actually, what 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 is in my toolkit that makes me great? Because I was great and I can be great again. And actually, I just need to, you know, you know, what is it? Steer my boat through through the storm and the waters will get less choppy, but I can help them be less choppy. I can yeah. actively do things myself to, yeah. to be less choppy. And for some people... You know, they will take a lot of comfort out of yoga and meditation and walks. Other people, it'll be, I need to go and have a coffee with a friend or, you know, I mean, I, I, I've got a friend who I go out do, do very often, but, you know, go out for dinner with and, you know, dress up and put my heels on and go out and have, I'm like, oh, God, that, that's still there. Well, yeah. I can still do that then. Oh, yeah. oh, because we were foodies. We enjoyed going out for dinner. I'm like, well, that that's nice because I really miss that, and I feel a bit like myself again, and that that makes me feel happy, and I enjoy getting back to doing some of those things. And so it's about exploring those things, and and just because your person isn't here, it doesn't mean you can't do those things that filled you with joy. Sometimes you have to be a bit brave, and you know, put the big person pants on. Exactly, and I and I think you know sometimes it it looks different and as I'm always saying you know different doesn't mean bad it is just different and we have to find a different way of living and being and creating a, a life that can feel good again and and you know that Simon's death um I think has been one of my biggest learning curves in in terms of discovering me and there's still so much to discover you, you know but you do have to be honest in that you, you can't hide behind that that you know that the shadows I suppose it's it's really giving yourself the opportunity to explore all areas you know the light and the dark and 
and know that they're okay. We've all made questionable choices. It's uh, to your point, the things, some of the things I did in my grief, I'm like, oh God, <laughs> what were you thinking, woman? Um, but you've got to do what you've got to do to get to where you've got to get. And and it, it's okay. It's it's just sort of educating your your future self, isn't it? Not shaming your your past self. And we are all learning we are all growing we are all navigating this journey and I think just giving yourself the opportunity to discover more about you will 100% support you in your your journey and and this is what I help people do in in my program you you know finding hope in widowhood it's it is that that deep deep dive into you and and that exploration um because it's it's so interesting there's so much under there Lindsay you've been brilliant you have been brilliant and yeah really really wonderful so informative um and and just there's so much in it it's Mm. fascinating and and I know our, our listeners will 100%. 100%. I mean, if, if anybody wanted to to connect with you at all, do you, do you have a, a, a Instagram yep, or a LinkedIn? Absolutely. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn. So that's where I, I live for business. My website is uh, www.linkengagement.com. Um, and my email is lindsay at linkengagement.com. But um, yeah, no, happy to answer any questions. And I'm in your group. I'm in your yes. um we you did know, a rising uh, Facebook group, yeah, with yeah. rising, so yeah. they can reach me. Find you there. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and your oh, insights and your wisdom. It's been amazing. Bless you, Lindsay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to the Widow Podcast with me, Karen Sutton. If you would like to be part of a supportive community of people who understand your grief come and join my free Facebook group, Widowed and Rising. And make sure you tune in to the next episode of the Widow Podcast. Podcast.